Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Opportunities in SNAP ENT Part 2, The Workforce Ecosystem. Today's webinar is generously sponsored by Burlington English, and today we have Amelia Bogus who's going to share a few words with us. Amelia? Thank you so much, James. All right, it's such a pleasure to be here and an honor to support COEB's mission to inspire educators so adults succeed and communities thrive. As many of you may know, Burlington English publishes curricula that helps adults learn English and learn workforce preparation skills. Burlington's blended suite of standards-based online courses prepares students with rigorous academic content, civics knowledge, career readiness skills, and digital literacy for all levels of instruction. Always growing to meet the needs of our educators, we are thrilled to introduce our newest series. Burlington Grammar for Beginners, Intermediate, and Advanced ESL students is a resource that can be used as a supplement to your curriculum. Teachers can dip into any of 120 grammar lessons for expansion or additional practice as needed. Burlington is here to help teachers and students to achieve success by offering professional development to meet your program needs. So we have a variety of these. Our on-demand training offers the opportunity to learn the fundamentals of Burlington English to quickly prepare for innovative instruction. Our virtual training provides the opportunity to collaborate with teachers across the nation through live topic-specific trainings offered monthly. And finally, our face-to-face -face or Zoom to Zoom allows your program to strategize with Burlington English representatives to make the most of teaching with Burlington English and to find ways to maximize the student usage and promote learning gains. Most importantly, at Burlington, we believe that people make a difference. Find your Burlington English person today at burlingtonenglish.com contact. Thanks so much for having us here today, James. Amelia, thank you so much. We're grateful for your support, Burlington English's friendship and support of adult education, and of course, COABE. Uh, without your support, we wouldn't be able to offer these webinars to our members, so we are appreciative. Thank you so much. And with that, I'm going to introduce our presenters today. We have Carla Garrett, Brandy Davis, Kristen Halverson, Clint Cummings, and Brandy Wisman. Please welcome them by saying hello, by typing your name in the chat box. Let us know where you're calling in from today. And if you have any questions during their presentation, you can submit those in the Q&A box. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our panelists. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kristen Halverson and I am the SNAP Policy Director and the SNAP Employment and Training Director with the Tennessee Department of Human Services. Today, I'm going to be sharing with you our SNAP ENT model in the state of Tennessee. So Tennis, for, in the state of Tennessee, the Tennessee Department of Human Services receives the direct grant from the United States Department of Agriculture to administer the ENT program. We partner with our Tennessee Department of Labor and Workforce Development that administers the services. So we have TDHS, Department of Human Services has oversight of the program. And we receive the grant and we work directly with our Department of Labor because they provide the services. We do this through an interagency grant or an interagency agreement. This agreement spells out what each agency's roles are, responsibilities, and it's our contract that states, you know, what each agency will do to carry out this program. Um, we receive referrals and we send them over to labor for ENT. And so the way that it works is that if somebody comes into the office and they apply for SNAP and they are approved and they're not on TANF, 
we make a referral over to labor, an ET referral. This is an automated referral through our eligibility system. This referral is sent directly to labor system. This also could occur for not just somebody that's applying and gets approved for SNAP, but somebody that's on SNAP that may call one of our call centers and state, I want to volunteer for the ET program. We are a voluntary program, so there's no penalty for not participating in the program. Additionally, EET is offered statewide in all 95 counties as well. Another way that we receive EET referrals and provide them over to labor is through what's called third-party partner reverse referrals. A reverse referral is when a customer walks into um, one of our third-party partners or our American Job Centers and states they want to participate in ET, they want to volunteer for the program. Then that partner will reach out to our ET coordinators, who then will go ahead and verify that they're actually receiving SNAP. The customer has to be the one that's eligible for SNAP, not just the household. The household could be eligible, but the customer themselves have to be eligible to be referred. If the customer is eligible and participating in SNAP, then we can refer them through our eligibility system over to the Tennessee Department of Labor and Workforce Development System. And that's our warm handoff. And so this right here is a flow chart that we're gonna go through in this presentation that explains that warm handoff from the Department of Human Services over to the Department of Labor. Carla Garrett, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carla Garrett. I am with Tennessee Department of Labor and Workforce Development. And as Kristen said, we operate or execute the SNAP ENT program and um, in partnership with Tennessee Department of Human Services. So they receive that funding directly from um, the federal government. And through that interagency, because we are both state agencies, we're able to pass that funding to uh, Department of Labor to execute the program, which fits perfectly into our workforce structure. Um, so as Kristen said, individuals can be referred to the SNAP ENT program through multiple points, through their DHS um, case manager, through our third party partners, or through our staff that is working in the American Job Centers. That referral will um, we'll send that to Department of Human Services so that they can determine eligibility for the individuals to participate in SNAP ENT. And then that referral will come from Department of Human Services system to Department of Labor system, um, where we operate our workforce programs. And from there, we're able to get a partial application so that we can start that process of moving the individual from just interested in the program to participating in SNAP ENT. Once we get that information, we go ahead and set up an initial appointment for that individual so that we can talk to them, further explain what SNAP ENT is, what that will mean for them, get an understanding of the barriers that they face so that we can tailor the services that's available in SNAP ENT and our other workforce programs available to help meet their employment and training goals. And we'll see more about that structure here in a little bit. So with the partnership is very unique um, I'm not sure if other states do it, but in Tennessee, um, having that partnership with Department of Labor, SNAP employment and training fits perfectly within our infrastructure that we have. The Tennessee Department of Labor also oversees the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, or WIOA. I know it's a lot of different names. Um, and so we have other workforce programs that operate very similar to SNAP ENT. So here you can see the structure of how we deliver these programs in Tennessee. Specific to WIOA, um, we are governed by the State Workforce Board, Department of Labor then works with our local workforce development boards to oversee our brick and mortar American job centers. In these job centers, we have the WIOA workforce programs, Title I, Title II, which is our adult education, Title III, our Wagner-Pizer, you see SNAP ENT is located in our American Job Centers, Title IV, Vocational Rehabilitation, and JVSG, which is our Jobs for Veterans State Grants. Because the Department of Labor also oversees these other federal workforce programs, it fits seamlessly to include SNAP ENT there. And we're able to serve participants through multiple entry points. So it could be a situation where an individual is being served in Title I 
And what we find across these programs is that the populations intended to be served through these programs are the same across the board. So where Title I looks to serve individuals with barriers who are low income, receiving public assistance from federal or state programs, SNAP employment and training is a program for individuals receiving um, SNAP benefits. So they are receiving public assistance. So that individual can be served across multiple programs. So it's a chance for us to what we say co-enroll in multiple programs so that we're able to meet those individuals' needs as best we can. And we're also to, able to braid funding across the program. So where SNAP employment and training can't cover costs, we can co-enroll in another program that can cover those costs. Or we could leverage each program where funding may be limited for one program, we can co-enroll them in several programs to leverage that funding so that we're not just expending from one program solely, but we're um, using all programs. Our American job centers are located throughout the state of Tennessee. So access to all of our workforce to our workforce structure is accessible in all 95 counties. So you'll see here, we have a different variety of American job centers, comprehensive centers, affiliates, specialized centers, or access points. So we've expanded the entry points, again, for individuals to engage in the workforce. Um, our staff that execute SNAP and ENT, they're the experts in that on the ground. Uh, they are located across the state. So individuals across the entire state is able to um, enter into the program. Now, we can't do this alone. While we uh, have the interagency with Department of Human Services, we utilize Department of Labor state staff to execute programs in the American Job Centers. But we also contract with third party partners who have a wider footprint, a more intimate footprint in the communities, and they're able to engage individuals as well. Um, so I'll pass it off to Clint Cummins, who is one of our third party partners here in the state of Tennessee. Wonderful, thank you, Carla. Clint Cummings with the University of Tennessee Extension. As Carla said, we are a third party partner provider. And in terms of our community-based organizations where folks are located out throughout the state, we wanna use the term partnership very, very broadly, okay? And so it's uh, really essentially agencies working together to meet common goals. Uh, and, and the goals ultimately will, will benefit the, uh, the, the participant in the end. Um, these can range from very informal collaborations to more formal where there's actually a formal agreement that uh, results in additional third party partners. So an agency becomes a SNAP, and, uh, SNAP employment and training provider as a third party partner and is eligible for par uh, partial reimbursement of the funds being expended as a partner out in, out in the state. So I tend to think of it as a continuum and we want to intersect and engage with, with our partnering agencies at whatever level they are able to engage. And so some are, uh, you know, have, have more capacity than others. Uh, so if it means that we can you know, put brochures in the lobby to tell participants about the program, if we can get before a group of participants to, to tell about the program, or if we enter into a more formal uh, relationship with this, with this partner and, and help them to become a third party partner themselves, the important thing is to really engage with the, um, with the partner at the level at which uh, they are able. Benefits, uh, as you probably know, that uh, we can accomplish more together than any one of us could alone. In terms of, of the agency, uh, the, the agency is able, able to uh, provide services that they may not otherwise be able to provide for the participants who they, who they serve every day. For the SNAP, from the SNAP employment and training perspective, uh, we are able to engage with and reach more individuals than we might be able to otherwise. And so, you know, together again, the, the uh, participant is the ultimate beneficiary of, of our collaborations here. Some challenges, so it's easy enough to lay out on paper challenges. Uh, there's lots of logistics. We each have our ways of doing things. Uh, we each, there's kind of the siloed uh, effect, whether we want there to be or not, where, where our, our world um, helps shape our vantage point. And uh, it seems that you know, things are done from a certain perspective. We may assume sometimes that everybody, A, understands what that perspective is, and B, that that's, uh, you know, the way they do business as well, which we know is just not uh, is not is not um, how things really work. 
there are some intricacies to SNAP employment training, some things that do fall under the umbrella and some things that do not, some things that would be eligible for funding and some things that are not eligible for funding. And so a challenge I think as well is to help everyone be on the same uh, page, so to speak, on, on what is SNAP employment and training and maybe what falls outside of that. A challenge when we talk about reimbursement uh, can come that, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, the funding sometimes um, the thought of funding maybe takes precedence over the actual implementation of, of the program in practice. And so really uh, the way to set this up, we've seen in practice is, you know, the program serving the individual with eligible activities and um, let the funding kind of support that and help the agency be able to expand upon that rather than see this ultimately as a funding source that, that one can build a program around. It's a, it, it's a way to support uh, a program that is uh, either already in existence or already being developed in such a way that more of that can be done. Reimbursement can be used for uh, providing additional services. It can be used for providing a greater depth of services or hopefully uh, reaching and serving more individuals. Opportunities quickly. Um, the barrier to an informal partnership is uh, those are those are pretty low. Uh, it's essentially allowing us to work together to you know provide the services that we provide to people who are already being served who are eligible for for SNAP. That's that's a, a, an opportunity that we we deal with every day. That's really easy to get involved with. Not a lot of commitment. Not a lot of time commitment. Um, and, and it really benefits the participant in a very short amount of time. All the way up through this more formal partnership that we've been talking about, the opportunity there is someone with the program uh, that's serving the right audience, that is providing the activities that would fall within the scope of SNAP employment and training, and who has a, a non-federal funding source to, to fund those activities. There is the opportunity, it's more involved, but to become a third-party partner implementing the program that who would be eligible for partial reimbursement as we had as we had mentioned. So I will then turn it back over I think to Kristen. Something that's really neat about Tennessee's model and our SNAP employment and training ecosystem is that we have a wide variety of support services. I like to look at our program as there's no wrong door approach. If there's a barrier, let's find a way to overcome it. Whether it's a, you know, a WIOA resource through co-enrolling or whether it's a DHS resource that we have or a resource that UT Extension has, there's that no wrong door approach. So we have child care assistance for employment and training participants. Um, this is a fantastic program because it's based on a sliding scale. So if a customer is participating in e and and they're not employed, of course, they're not gonna have to pay a, a fee. However, if, even once they gain their employment, they will have to pay a fee, but we offer that child care payment assistance. We all know that child care is a, a pretty big barrier to gaining employment or going back to school or getting a vocational training. And so the way that it works is the Department of Labor staff actually makes the child care referral to the certificate program, indicating that the customer is an ENT and participating. Through status notices, we also um, let child support know who's participating as well from the TDHS in. And not only that, but it's a 12 month child care certificate. So this provides customers a resource that they may not have had before. Something else that's really great about our child care program is for customers that are coming off TANF, that have reached their 60 month time limit, that are no longer on TANF, but still on benefits, they can participate in ENT and still be able to get childcare. So we really also try to target that population to make sure that those resources are there for them. Or just for a customer that's on TANF that wants to save their 60 months, that wants to save their, their, their counter, their months, they're able to participate in EAT and still get childcare services. We also work directly with our child support team, which is also under the umbrella of DHS. And um, I do want to add that child support and child care are both under the DHS umbrella. We started having discussions about child support in our EET participants in 2016. It's the shared belief that it, 
you know, a employment that offers a living wage is a vehicle out of poverty. And we're serving similar clients. So why not be able to help them through the employment and training program and through child support? So in 2020, the child support team began to identify parents who owed child support and parents who, you know, also were deficient of that and trying to pay their child support, not just the ones paying child support currently, but also the ones that are trying to be in good standing with that. And so parents that are in compliance with the ENT program, child support will, can request inform, enforcement actions such as contempt and license suspension, suspension and not be taken against the parent. So these penalties for not part, like complying with child support, if they're participating at ENT on a case by case basis, we can assist those clients. Um, similar to what I stated about status notices. We receive status notices from the Department of Labor through a weekly email. It's a 30 day notice, whether a client's participating, whether they're waiting for orientation, um, whether they are not participating or whether they've completed the program. And this is how our other divisions are able to identify how we can assist them from the child support standpoint of the customers that owe child support and how we can assist them to ensure that they are complying with ENT and receiving childcare as well. So these status notices we receive from labor that comes directly from their system gives us a lot of information to be able to also assist with those support services. And Brandy Wiseman, I'm gonna turn it over to you for the resource slide. Thanks, Kristen. Um, so here at APHSA, the American Public Human Services Association, we've been doing some really um, good work in SNAP ENT and sharing out some, some examples of strong partnerships between agencies and providers. And we've developed a couple of technical assistance tools around that. Um, so just wanted to draw your attention to two that are sort of hot off the presses. Uh, one was shared in the previous um, webinar, the, the part one of this series, and I really encourage you, we've dropped the link in the chat. I encourage you, if you didn't have an opportunity to look at that um, before being on this call, or if you um, weren't able to attend, go ahead and look back at that. It's got a lot of really rich information about SNAP ENT, and it sort of gives you a basis for what SNAP ENT is all about and how you can use it. Um, so the first resource that I want to draw your attention to is the framework to collaboration and communication for improved participant outcomes. And again, this really examines those mechanics of strong partnerships. And um, this is actually uh, a labor of love that Kristen was involved in as part of the Pathways to Partnership Symposium that we had last September. And all of this information has been taken from key stakeholders that are involved in SNAP ENT, including state agencies, third party providers, um, just uh, third party direct service providers. And um, yeah, so the link, it's linked within the PowerPoint, which I believe will be sent out to you. And then the second one, uh, the second resource that we have is the readiness roadmap that was actually linked previously in the um, first webinar series. And it's really, it's, it's the first in a three part uh, series that's designed to um, sort of gauge your readiness to become a SNAP ENT provider and provide some answers to those questions that you have about just initially getting started. Uh, thank you so much, Kristen. I'm gonna turn it over to Brandy, who's our moderator to start the, the question and answer. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, have a few questions just to kick it off for the audience to kind of um, give them um, some some initiative to ask some questions that they may have, some impeding questions. Um, one of the questions that I would like to ask specifically to Clint around the third party partnership between the two agencies, um, what has helped you most in your role as a third party partner? And in saying that, what advice would you have for current third party partners or organizations that are interested in becoming a third party partner? And if you could, Clint, elaborate on what third party partner means, because it does appear just based on the chat that there are a few individuals here that are not as familiar with the SNAP ENT program. So if you could just elaborate on those acronyms of what that partnership looks like, what it means and the effects um, it has currently. 
Very good. Now that's a multi-part question, Brandy. So if I do not answer one of those parts, please, please be, bring me back around. I think it's been answered in the chat, but a third party partner is essentially another, it, not the implementing agency. So another partner who uh, provides staff employment and training services as a partner, but it's under a, a, an official agreement. So it's a contracted agreement where um, there's services that are provided and the, the cost, there's a partial reimbursement that comes back for those costs in order to be able to continue to provide or provide more, more services. Um, so Brandy, your, your first question had to be, you know, what, what is that maybe what we do a little bit, what, um, and then some advice. So a third party partner, we are providing direct service to folks out in the um, out in the communities. So we really, uh, what I think this is actually your first question is, how, what makes that work, right? What are, what are the, the strengths and benefits to that? How has that been um, brought about? And really the key is the relationship that we have with our state partners, with the Department of uh, Labor and Workforce Development, and then with the Department of Human Services is, is to be able to sit at the same table. We are always um, made to feel very, very welcome in these conversations and we, we really feel like we are a part of the structure within the state, which says a lot because naturally, you know, we're not part of your workforce system. And so it's a way to integrate um, folks who are not, you know, maybe natively part of that system into that system, because we know that the system is not at one layer or one level, that, that it, there are, um, you know, the, the needs expand across the state in, in, in various forms advice or, or suggestions for folks who, who would like to come on board. Something I, I've said and I always say to people in the conversation uh, about third party partnerships is you know, think big, but start small, dream big, have all of the, you know, wow, we could do this and this and this with this partial reimbursement, you know, we could really expand that all, that's wonderful. That is keep that sort of a vision and thought, but then uh, on a practical level, where can we start and get some traction and, and show some success, get the programs off the ground to be able to build uh, and add to over time. I've seen the opposite happen where sometimes it's, you know, they want the $10 million idea. Well, really, we need to start with a with a much smaller, um, you know, kind of succinct sort of concept and, and grow and build from there. Now, Brandy, I have no idea if I actually covered each of your points. If not, please, uh, please remind me of, of others you would like me to address. I, you actually did, Clint. Um, and what, what I was trying to do with that question is really bring a, a larger perspective as to your experience with the partnership between both uh, agencies to really show what that true collaboration and partnership looks like. And I think that's, that says a lot about how effective uh, Tennessee SNAP Employment and Training Program has been. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, I have one, I have a few other questions I'm going to direct to our state uh, partners. Um, one in particular is, uh, and this is for Kristen and, and the Carlas on the call, um, if you could, what would you say is the importance of the SNAP ENT's mission of both state agencies and the individuals that you serve. So understanding that you have different um, needs for the participants that are coming into your doors, how does that complement uh, both state agencies? You're muted, Kristen. Muted, Kristen, I'm sorry. That's a great question, Brandy. And I think it'd be really worth stating what our missions are to explain how we're able to serve our customers and carry out those missions. For the Tennessee Department of Human Services, our mission is to build strong families by connecting Tennesseans to employment, education, and support services. The Tennessee Department of Labor and Workforce Development's mission is to improve the workplace environment and economic prosperity through workforce development. Both agencies want to increase capacity and we want to reduce dependency. We want to serve our customers by offering opportunities for education, employment, and support services to promote self-sufficiency. Collaboration is extremely important to both agencies to seamlessly provide wraparound services to our customers and to help bridge the gap of understanding of the next steps in getting industry recognized credentials. 
So ultimately, we want to provide these opportunities to our customers. And we know by doing so, it's through working together collaboratively and not being in silos, because a lot of us are serving similar customers. So why not work together to provide the link to employment or education? Because TDHS may be able to have one resource to provide a customer, just like labor may be able to have another, or just like Clint and UT Extension may be able to have another. So it's about sharing those resources and providing that one-stop resource, that one-stop you know, location to be able to provide a holistic approach and providing services to the customers and again, ultimately reducing dependency. So Carla, I'm gonna pass it yeah, over to you. Yeah, so that's great, Krista. And like she said, the mission of labor is to increase uh, prosperity, financial prosperity for our participants and get them engaged in the workforce. So SNAP employment and training goes hand in hand with that. And so the population that we are looking to serve is traditionally underserved or left out of the workforce or they don't have the means to participate in the workforce as effectively as, as some of their peers that may not, that aren't low income. And so this program provides that benefit to them where they don't have to come out of their pocket for any cost. It is illegal for them to come out of their pocket for any cost. And if they do come out of their pocket for any cost, the SNAP employment training has a participant reimbursement to where the program will reimburse them for those costs. So really removing those barriers, whatever it is that is hindering them from participating in the workforce or continuing their education and their training. Um, so we work really hard to get individuals connected to training to in-demand occupations. Let's get them that certification, get them that license. Um, they could go through the class and a lot of times individuals don't have the means to pay for that test to get that license, but the SNAP employment and training program can come in and cover that cost. So um, it just really goes hand in hand with what we look to do with labor. And like Kristen said, having multiple entry points. So the benefit of having the program shared between Department of Human Services and labor is that the ENT program fits into our workforce structure. So that image that I showed before, they can come into an American Job Center and get access to all of these programs. So um, where SNAP employment and training can't cover certain costs, um, there are rules to the program about what we can and cannot pay for. So what can't be covered in SNAP, but it's still necessary for the individual to successfully participate in employment or training, another program can come in and cover that support. So really wrapping the workforce structure and the programs around the participant to make sure that they have everything that they need to succeed um, and, and reach that self-sufficiency so where they're not dependent on a federal program to meet their basic needs. Thank you both. I think that says a lot about the program and just from a bird's eye view um, for the audience, I was a former SNAP ENT participant. Uh, now working, I work between both agencies, sister agencies, the Department of Labor, the Workforce Services side and the Department of Human Services side and now with the local board in Tennessee. So you definitely covered every base that I was trying to pull out to really show the true effectiveness and partnership between the program and the benefits that it offers the participants. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, what do you see, um, and this is for everyone, um, panelists on the call, how do you see uh, the impact of growing the SNAP employment and training program um, participation? Like why is that important more broad, on a broader perspective uh, for the state? I mean, so we are trying to increase participation in the workforce and this program helps do that. Uh, it like, again, it removes those barriers where these individuals can participate in the workforce. Um, it's, it's very important to, to the economy, to the society that individuals participate in the workforce and this program helps, um, helps propel them into that. How do you just see a I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kristen. Okay. No, and just just to add to what Carla was stating, it's really through analyzing those internal, external, and informal partnerships, and really analyzing what hinders program participation, and determining how we can overcome those barriers. Mm -hmm. So, 
you know, growing our, you know, foot, like expanding our footprint, yes, but also analyzing what hinders participation and looking of how we can leverage these partnerships to have more individuals participate and be able to take advantage of these support services to push them into, not push them, but to encourage them to get into employment or go back to school or go through a vocational training. So again, it's about analyzing those partnerships and analyzing what hinders participation currently. Thank you, Kristen. And I know that we are all seeing in any program, WIOA or non-core WIOA programs, um, there's been a huge challenge because of the pandemic. And I know that we're kind of coming out of the pandemic. Um, currently, what do you see as a huge challenge for engaging and serving this particular population? Um, how has it indirectly or directly affected uh, the program um, participation and increase over time? Brandy, can you repeat that question one more time, please? So the question was more so because of COVID. I know that a lot of programs, federally funded programs are um, having a huge challenge with participation and engagement and understanding what the state's goal is for increasing participation in SNAP ENT. Are your challenges, let me reframe the questions, are your challenges any different from any other program um, that is experiencing um, uh, issues with uh, participation and engagement. Um, is that affecting your uh, performance and outcome on the back end, or do you see the momentum still, Great. still steady? Great question. So it's interesting for Tennessee, and uh, Carl, I'm going to have you add on to this piece, because our participation increased. Uh, because we've had the increase of people applying for SNAP that are needing these resources. And so something that we do from an eligibility perspective at Department of Human Services is we do what's called motivational interviewing. So when we go into that conversation with the customer, we're discussing ENT upfront and we're, we're providing all the information regarding support services, participant reimbursement, and it's a motivational interview to encourage customers to enroll in the program and volunteer for the program. So as we see the increase in applications and the increase in customers that we're serving, we're also making sure that those discussions are meaningful and explaining what employment and training is. So when we make that referral to labor, our customers are aware what the program has to offer and then they can take that next step and doing a you know an employment plan and going through their steps. And Carla, that's where I'm gonna toss, pass it over to you. <laughs> yeah, so with us, with labor overseeing other workforce programs, SNAP, like Kristen said, was the exact opposite where our other programs saw a decline in participation, SNAP increased drastically. Uh, part of that was our ability to adapt to the situation that was happening. Um, so sn our SNAP ENT program was transitioning to virtual services um, prior to COVID happening. So we were able to take what we had already implemented and enhance it and increase access on a virtual scale for our participants. Uh, so engaging our participants wasn't um, difficult in the past two years. It, it, it was pretty smooth. Um, the challenge, though, has been um, spreading the knowledge about the SNAP ENT program. Um, and, and amongst those, amongst staff that work with individuals that are receiving these benefits. Um, and so in the chat or in the question and answer, um, someone asks, what does it mean for adult education providers uh, providing education service? Like, how can they get plugged in? And it's knowing about the SNAP employment and training program, who it serves, what it can do, and knowing where to refer them in your state. Um, so we've made access to the ENT program um, fairly easy where an individual can, on their own or with a staff member, can send their information, request that they receive more information or be contacted about the ENT program, and we're able to connect with them and explain what it is. And so as an as a educator, as someone touching the community, being aware of what the program is and referring them to it, recognizing that they have a need, they want to go to school, but they don't have any funding, what kind of program is out there that can help support you in that, and having SNAP ENT in your toolkit um, to be able to pull out and say, hey, check this program out, it may be able to help. 
Um, so our challenge really has been spreading the word. Um, and like Clint was saying in one of our talks, it's like we're a best kept secret, but we don't want to be. Uh, mm -hmm. We want everyone to know what SNAP BNT is and, and that it's here to help. So that's been one of the challenges for us. Thank you both. Thank you both. I want to take this opportunity to open it up. I know Brandy Wiseman is uh, kind of flowing through the chat, catching questions that individuals may have. I'm not um, uh, multitasking at this point. I'm trying to focus on asking my questions, but I do want to open it up for opportunity for the audience to ask any specific questions that they may have around the program. Um, Brandy, I don't know if, if you have some jotted down that you may have not answered yet, so I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you all. Thanks, Brandy. I sure do. The, the question and answer, we have a lot of questions, which is great. Um, so are you using ability to benefit creating financial aid access for non-GED or high school diploma as part of these wraparound services? Clint, that may be something that maybe you can answer potentially, just given your background. So um, I was going to try to, is, is the question typed up here? Is So we interface with folks. So if we're at a school, if, if we're at a TCAT or community college, one of our colleges of applied technology or community college, you know, financial aid is really handled they're already in the process of applying for financial aid or we if we were to connect them to school we can help them walk through that process but the financial aid itself is really uh, worked out between the individual and the the training provider where we come in would be if this if assistance is needed and support is needed for that and but to to be able to fill the gaps that financial aid uh does not cover and so i'm not honestly familiar with the if that's a particular adult Ed term uh, that I'm not, you know, familiar with, but in in general, uh, we do provide uh, funding for tuition that is not covered otherwise. If it's not, you know, if it's not covered by Pell Grant, other financial aid, we don't take into account uh, loans. We don't, you know, ask our folks to to get loans. But there are uh, different different types of financial aid, and we look then what are the costs that have not been covered uh, beyond, you know, what's the what's the remaining need, and that's where SNAP ENT can can step in. And Brandy, you uh, feel free to um, clarify a little bit if I didn't answer that question. Exactly. I think you did, but just to add perspective, so uh, we do a lot of co-enrollment and dual enrollment. Uh, again, as Carla and Kristen stated, um, the SNAP ENT program in Tennessee is flushed out through third-party partners um, and through our American Job Center. So individuals uh, have access to a vast array of services outside of SNAP ENT. And of course, once we make them eligible, then they could participate either through co-enrollment or dual enrollment in adult education, high set, which is what we call it now, um, instead of GED, um, and which was a similar pathway for me. So uh, to the audience, I was a high school dropout, <laughs> uh, no job, went into the uh, Department of Human Services uh, building to get benefits, got qualified for benefits, and they sent me through that referral process as Paula went through to the American Job Center to get additional services to create a career pathway for me. And one of the first steps for me was to be dual enrolled into adult education, where I was able to go back and get my high school diploma um, and then work my way up from there. Um, so I, I hope that I answered the question that was asked. So we do do a lot of tying the knots and, and connecting the dots dependent, it, it is a case by case basis, but for the most part, we are always encouraging and trying to provide those wraparound services for any individual, no matter which way they come into our program. I'm, I'm not sure if Carla or Kristen wanna add anything. Yeah, so the beauty, one of the beauties of the SNAP employment and training program is that we can support those career pathways or those jobs that don't necessarily require an individual to have a high school diploma or a GED. Um, so this particular app, Ability to Benefit, we don't use, but we do assess that individual and what they need. So they come into the program and they don't have their high school diploma or GED. Of course, we want to work with them to get that, but we also want to work with them to get employment as well. And so if they can enter into a training um, or employment where that high school diploma GED isn't necessary um, or isn't required, and they can work as well as work to obtain their high school diploma, we can support that. 
Um, so I'll use truck driving. I'm not sure if truck driving requires a high school diploma or not, uh, but if it doesn't, they're able to go through that training uh, for their CDL license, obtain their CDL license, and pursue their high school diploma, and we're able to support that career path. Thanks so much, Carla and Brandy, for sharing, and Clint as well. Um, another question that we have is, how did the stimulus checks from the past two years affect the people you serve? I can take that one. That's a great question, because in order to participate at ENT, you have to be eligible for SNAP, okay? So there is the federal unemployment, and then there was also the stimulus checks. And there was federal guidance on how to treat each in which was excluded and which was included. So that's looked at by a case by case basis because some of these additional COVID payments that individuals are receiving could have been excluded from SNAP. You just have to determine which one it was and excluded for a certain period of time. Um, so with that being said, that didn't with the policy changes, it didn't hinder participation or people applying, but again, depending on what type of COVID relief, whether it be stimulus, federal pandemic unemployment, regular unemployment, depending on what they received, depended on whether it's excluded or whether it was included to be able to make the determination whether they're eligible. Now, once we were able to make that determination, if they were eligible, then we referred them over to the ENT program. But again, depending on the type of payment, because there was a lot of different payments at that time, depended on whether it was included or excluded in their SNAP case. Carla, I don't know if you have anything you want to add on that, that, that kind of eligibility perspective, that's where that stands. And from a provider perspective, our numbers went up as well. And um, I'll be honest, these are, are some of the hardest working folks that, that, that I know. They, they, um, they go to school, lots of times they have children maybe there's a part-time job involved. And so, you know, our folks uh, who, who we're serving, you know, by and large, they, they are working so very hard. We do not see, because it's voluntary, we do not see that, oh, you know, stimulus money came. And so therefore people don't need to work for, you know, again, our numbers went up. There were more enrollees. There were more folks going to school. The challenge became where we couldn't do the uh, partner to partner outreach that I described. Partners were closed and they weren't providing those services. But in terms of the participants themselves, um, you know, hopefully uh, as it continues, but they're just uh, more and more uh, folks who are interested in, in, in pursuing this and pursuing higher education or additional training leading to employment. And so, um, you know, from a provider's perspective, we didn't see uh, a bump on our end. Thanks so much, Clinton, Kristen. We have an additional question. Um, is this similar to TANF where a number of hours is required, uh, is, yeah. is needed, or is this based on outcome? Oh, great question on that one. So this is different than TANF in the sense that here's where hours plays a role. So for SNAP, there's what's called work requirements. Okay, there's work registrants, there's ABODs, and there's customers participating in employment and training, which again, keep in mind, that's a voluntary program in the state of Tennessee. Currently, we're under a national pandemic waiver of the ABOD time count. So if a customer is on SNAP, if we weren't under this national pandemic waiver, they only get three months at a 36 month time frame of SNAP benefits unless they're exempt from the requirements through federal exemptions or such as being disabled or um, such as not meeting the age criteria or they have to do work activity. That work activity is either working 20 hours per week at a job, volunteering 20 hours per week, doing in-kind work 20 hours per week, or a training program, such as the employment and training program. So ENT is part of that. Okay, so when it comes to hours, at that point, if we're not under a pandemic waiver, the customer actually has to be participating for 20 hours a week or 80 hours per month in order to continue receiving SNAP. So that's where these status notices are so important to our team. Because if you're an ABOD, which I, I know I drop a lot of acronyms, I'm trying to be conscious about explaining an able-bodied adult without dependents between the ages of 18 and 50, and we are not under a waiver, you have to participate in one of those things. In ENT, we receive the status notices from labor, letting us know that that customer is doing 20 hours per week or 80 hours per month. So it's crucial for that customer to continue receiving SNAP. 
because if they don't have a federal exemption and we're not under a national pandemic waiver, they have to be participating for that hour requirement. So again, it's totally different from TANF and the fact that it's not that, I believe it's a 30 hour requirement. This right here has to do with the ABOD factor. Um, also, something that's totally different is we, our childcare program is not the same as the TANF childcare program. Our childcare program, you're participating at ENT, we're gonna refer you to childcare. It's that simple. Doesn't matter which component you're doing, we're gonna refer you to, we're gonna, if you need childcare, that's a barrier, we're gonna refer you over to childcare. So that's how hours play a role in ENT is meeting a specific criteria in order to receive SNAP if there's an ABOD time limit in place. But again, with the pandemic, we've been under a national pandemic waiver that, that changes that criteria quite a bit. So, Thanks, Kristen. Um, and then uh, another question, what services do you offer that are specific to ESL? So in the SNAP ENT program, um, ESL, if they are receiving those SNAP food benefits, they're eligible to participate in ENT and they have access to all of the services that are provided um, in the program. So it's not necessarily specific to them, but they do have access to everything that is provided um, in the program. Great, thanks so much. And I noticed that my colleague, Mary Nelson, actually has been in the chat and she provided some information on ability to benefit. Um, National Governors Association did an action lab on it. Uh, so I encourage you to, to check that out if you have any questions around ability to benefit. Um, I am not seeing any additional questions, Brandy. Um, I hope I've done justice to the question and answer session. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Brandy. I know everybody's getting confused. There's two Brandys on the call. We're kind of tag teaming. Um, are there any additional comments or questions that the audience has that we maybe overlooked in this session? Well, I'll take that silence as consent. Um, <laughs> I have one wrap up question. I'm not going to hold you guys. It looks like we're coming up on time. Um, so just as a perspective from Tennessee um, in thinking about the SNAP program and how much it has grown and expanded over time, we both know that it's not the same program it was 10 years ago and definitely not the same program it was um, and the services offered five years ago. So just as an added carrot to the team, you know, I love Tennessee, I champion the program. Um, so just as an added carrot to the audience, just to show the true effects of the program and how much we have expanded, you guys have expanded, I'm sorry, I think I'm still with the state agency, apologies. Uh, however, uh, what does your, you know, from a, a budget standpoint, your budget used to be what, three, four million? three, four, five years ago? And can you give a added care to what the budget looks like now? I think it says a lot about how many individuals you're actually touching annually and what that performance looks like on the back end. Yeah, so I could take this, Kristen, if, you, if you're like. Uh, so yes, uh, we get a set amount from the, the, the federal government for SNAP. There are different buckets, all of that. Uh, but I think, like you said, um, a few years ago, we were bringing in or asking for about $4 million to operate with the third party partners that we have to run at the state agency. Um, and this past fiscal year, we requested $18 million. Uh, so we grew pretty significantly, um, and that's and we grew in our partner base as well. Um, I think UT Extensions Clint um, started as a third party partner and has expanded to be an intermediary as well, meaning that his organization will bring partners on under him uh, to execute the program as well. So we we've, we've grown quite a bit, and it's our hope that we continue to grow and that Snap and T becomes a regular program in our workforce structure. It becomes part of our natural language. Uh, when we talk about workforce programs, the public workforce uh, structure and system, and we all, uh, we are talking about SNAP ENT as well. It, it's, it's right in there, so. Thank you, Carla. 
Brandy and James, Amelia, I don't have anything else to add. I do want to take the time out to, to, to thank everyone, the audience, for joining. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to shoot them to uh, James. I believe he's kind of going to be uh, checking those emails and making sure we answer those questions as uh, they are asked and sharing with the team. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to digress here because, again, I can talk to a tree if it'll talk back. So I'm just going to stop here if there's nothing else to add. Thank you, everyone. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I want to thank all of our panelists. And I want to thank Amelia with Burlington English for sponsoring today's presentation. Uh, what an awesome presentation. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, for the audience members, if you could take a few seconds to answer our single poll question, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, and just for informational purposes, the replay with the materials of this webinar will be posted to coave.org and available for download for our members uh, within about 24 hours of the conclusion of this. And with that, everybody's free to go. I hope everybody has a great day and a great rest of the week. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye.